Thanks very much for uh, inviting me to speak and for the uh, warm introduction. Okay, so, um, so I'll be speaking today about mainly about applications of computer vision uh, in the mining industry. Um, and I'm going to do my best to try to keep this talk at, at a level that you don't need to be um, from a mining background or from a geoscience background to understand. Um, and uh, the outline for the talk today will, will be, um, first of all, some background, uh, particularly in, in mining uh, and computer vision. Uh, I'm going to keep the technical review of computer vision to a minimum, given this audience um, will have a lot of expertise uh, in, in that space. Uh, and then I'm going to step through three different case studies that, that show the application of computer vision to that, that type of imagery and try to explain how that is kind of to the benefit of, of, of mining. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the various people that have contributed to some of the projects that you'll see today. Um, uh, we have a relatively large team of, of technical people um, that are but from you know, software engineering, computer vision, data science, and, and geoscience disciplines. And I'm really showing their work today. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge that. Okay, so just to set the scene a little bit, um, the mining sector is currently undergoing a really um, rapid sort of phase of digitalization and, and, and modernization. Um, and you know, mining is has a long way to go. Um, it's it's, but it is rapidly changing at the moment, and and mainly doing that in response to a couple of things. One is that we have a, a increasing demand for for various types of of, um, of mined metals, particularly those that um, are related to the energy transition and, and battery metals, um, and also for the fact that it's becoming harder and harder to actually find new ore deposits that contain. These um these these metals that we need um for for the for the coming decades, um so as a result of that kind of digitalization, mining companies are starting to collect a lot more data than they ever have. Um, there's lots of different kinds of data they collect, obviously, but we're going to focus a lot on the image-based data sets that they collect. Um, image-based data is is a very dense form of data that um is is collected all the way through the the, the exploration kind of value chain from from early stage discovery all the way through to the processing of all. Um, and the question I'm going to try to answer or at least demonstrate in this talk today is how do we actually maximize that, that data, um, getting that data out of the imagery and trying to ex and ex streamline um, exploration and mining practices, um, ultimately to try to benefit um, you know, this, this, uh, this increase in demand that, that we're seeing um, globally at the moment. I'm not going to focus much on what computer vision is. Suffice to say that it, it is sort of under the umbrella of artificial intelligence, the very broad banner. Um, we're going to be focusing on the kind of intersection of deep learning and computer vision with most of the applications that we'll be talking about today. Um, of course, there are many other um, sort of um, you know, algorithms and things that fall outside of deep learning um, that, that are super useful. The, the key thing that I guess just as someone who has has come to this field um, you know relatively late is that I always presumed it was would, wouldn't be that difficult to teach a computer how to see um, see geology and see rocks. Um, and now that I'm in it and, and can see all the challenges, um, I've really come to to appreciate how difficult it is to to teach a computer to see things the way we see them. Um, you know as as people we have these really sophisticated visual systems that we don't really appreciate because it's all we know. Um, and it's actually really difficult to get a computer to behave and, and, and see things the way we see it. Um, albeit those systems do have a lot of other benefits I'll go through today as well. So that's probably what I'll, I'll, I'll pause on in terms of the technologies underlying computer vision. I normally have a much larger section to this, but this, this audience um, would, would uh, be beyond it. Let's, let's talk about some of the things that computers do really well. So computers that can see versus the human vision. Um, Computers, you know, are really good at, at, um, at seeing things at a very fine resolution. They're really good at seeing um, lots of imagery at a very large scale. So we've got this kind of great benefit of, of resolution and scale. Um, speed, um, you know, we can feed uh, a, a computer vision system thousands of images really quickly and it'll be able to spit out a result. Um, one thing that we focus on a lot at Data Rock is this idea of fluidity of models. Um, the idea being that in a lot of geological contexts, um, if we have a, a, a model that we're trying to apply to some geology, um, if uh, we have a computer that, that's, that's producing that data, we can modify the model and reapply it across a lot of imagery really quickly. 
which means that we can be very fluid with our models. They can adapt and change as we need. Um, <clears throat> computer vision models are, and, and computers they see are very consistent. They may not always be very accurate, but when they're inaccurate, they often are inaccurate in a very consistent way, which is very useful and very different to a person. Um, and then computer vision models are generally very auditable as well. So we, can, we don't necessarily, can't necessarily see into all the nitty gritty inside the neural networks, but we can see um, visual references about what was actually being um, analyzed when the model was working. And there's visual cues that we can have on the image that can tell us what was seen and, and how it was seen. Um, much more difficult to do that with a person. Um, with people, we have our own benefits and our own weaknesses. Um, people are really good at using the context and the background and knowledge and experience that they have to be able to see things um, uh, and, uh, and, and understand that thing that they're seeing. Um, we're very flexible and adaptable, so we can handle lots of changing of, of imagery sets and we can still see the thing we need to see. Um, we're very accurate, not always, but when we're well trained for the task at hand, we can be very accurate with what we see. And we're also really good at interpolation. You know, we know that our brains are really good at inventing data in between areas where we don't have any. Um, if we've got something that's obscured by something else, we're very good at, at kind of estimating what's behind it. Um, and so, again, it comes back to, um, you know, what's the real benefit of computer vision systems versus human vision? The ones I'll be focusing on are really that speed, scale, and resolution. Um, they're, they're the kind of the really the, the crux things that are, are really important to improving how we mine and, and improving efficiencies. Okay. So this is probably for those that are in the audience that aren't from kind of the geology or mining background, but I wanted to go through just some of the typical types of imagery and, and image-like data sets that you would collect in a mining environment. Um, so the image we're showing here is just a, I guess we call it a hand specimen. Um, that's, a, that's probably what most people think of when they say, well, what does a rock look like? It looks like a little chunk of rock you can hold in your hand. But we have lots of different forms of, of, of imagery that we can collect that's, that's imaging the rock itself. Um, and I'll go through those kind of some of the common types, not, not an exhaustive list. So a very common type is what we call drill core. Um, drill core is extracted from a drill rig, which basically drills into the ground and retrieves a cylinder of rock. Um, drill core is one of the main ways we sample the ground underneath our feet when we're trying to explore and develop a mine. Uh, and it's one of the most important kind of base data sets that we have um, when we're actually either developing a resource or trying to find it in the first place. So we can image that rock with things like RGB photography, just with a simple, you know, with your, your camera in your phone, for instance. Um, we could also look at, use LiDAR to image that core um, and, and, and look at the shape of the rock. Uh, and we can also do more sophisticated analysis, things like hyperspectral analysis, uh, X-ray fluorescence, laser ablation, in, laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, can reel off a whole bunch of different um, analytic methods. But suffice to say that these produce imagery and they're imaging the rock itself. So drill cores are a really common one. And we'll, one of our case studies will look at how we can interpret this type of imagery uh, with computer vision. Another really common uh, use case uh, is, is point clouds. Um, so we're seeing point clouds being collected more in lots of different industries. They're certainly being collected a lot more in the mining industry. Here we're looking at a pretty typical um, 3D point cloud from an underground uh, mine, uh, which basically could be collected either by a drone or by vehicle or even by a person. Um, and the idea is that we're, we're getting this lo lot of detailed information about the shape, textures of the rock underground. We could be uh, looking at particle size of, of the pieces of rock. We want to be looking at um, the overall shape of the development underground to make sure that everything's um, correct. Um, and because we're moving rock around underground most of the time in the mining environment, uh, LIDAR is a really good way to track that volume and, and how things are moving. So a really critical data set um, in the mining um, space. Uh, similar to LIDAR, we also have um, imagery types which are, are called 3D photogrammetry. Uh, this is really kind of a hybrid between an RGB photograph and a, and a LIDAR point cloud. We've got aspects of, of color and also shape being collected in those. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a example image from a, the wall of a very large open pit. What we're looking at is this kind of staircase or, or wall that, that kind of uh, makes up the size of the pit. Uh, we have uh, the walls, which are the kind of the vertical faces. And then we have benches that sit, um, have the horizontal uh, faces on top of that. And there's lots of geological information in those faces. And we need to do a lot of work to, to watch those faces, categorize them, understand them to make sure that 
that wall is stable and, and won't uh, cause any trouble. So we've got also got a case study we'll talk about today where we're going to analyze one of those walls and, and show how, how computer vision can do that job as well. If we go back to our drill core again, so we talked about that cylinder of rock that we extract from the ground. Well, we can also look at the converse, which is um, the hole that we've made in the ground. We can actually send a camera down that hole and actually image the, the sides of the hole. We call that the borehole image. Um, and it's really like a 360 degree image. Um, and here we've got an example. This is a, from a system called Televiewer. Um, it can look in the RGB or the visible range of light and also in the acoustic um, uh, range as well. And you can see here that we've got this kind of about five meters of drill core. We've got different textures, different kind of shapes and sinusoidal features that we can map. And you can see how much information you can get just from five meters of this imagery. We've got all these different planes cutting through the rock. Um, and this is typically done again by a person looking at the image and actually manually extracting that information, which is a very time consuming um, thing to do. And last one I'll talk about um, today is also geophysics. So um, we talked a bit about, you know, we can look at the visible range of, of light uh, to image rocks, but we can also look at other properties of those rocks. So in this case, we're looking at um, the distribution of a mineral called magnetite, but basically that is a proxy for how magnetic the rock is. So this image here we're looking at is, you know, tens of kilometers by tens of kilometers in size, very large scale image. An airplane is going to fly over some ground and it's going to record um, basically how magnetic the rocks are. And you can see that you get all these detailed textures and shapes and colors out of this image. And again, this image is something that people often interpret um, by hand to, in, to, to understand you know, what's going on inside that image and where might we be able to find an ore body and what, what are the rocks doing in that area? So, so we're gonna have a case study uh, immediately after this slide that we'll talk about how we can apply computer vision to this kind of data as well. Okay, so that's enough background. Let's dive into some actual applied um, examples of, of computer vision and, and this kind of geoscience or geological imagery. So um, the aim of the game here is we are taking an, a really cool image that we've created for the, for the whole Australian continent. So this is data set that the data sets that the state surveys and the government have put together. Um, we have created this kind of hybrid image that's looking at a few different geophysical properties. Um, I won't go too detailed into exactly what it is, but suffice to say, this is what the rocks beneath our feet look like over the Australian continent. If we were looking at how dense the rocks were and how magnetic, magnetic they were. And so what we're gonna do um, uh, in this um, uh, case study is we're going to apply some computer vision um, processes to search for imagery um, that, that might be similar to something we, we, we have an interest in and also to group imagery and domain them into populations that appear to be visually similar. So we're gonna do those kind of two pretty typical kind of computer vision tasks uh, with this um, large scale geophysical image. Oops, I've just jumped ahead of my slide. So yeah, so the key thing, why would we wanna do something like this? So um, we wanna do that because we wanna do some things that people don't do that well uh, in, in this particular case. One of the things that, that um, that we can do is look at a very large amount of imagery very quickly. We can look at it in a very quantitative way. Um, so we can compare the similarity between images in, in, a, in a numerical way. Um, and then we can do that kind of search by similarity type process. And these are things that people can do to a degree, but, but aren't sort of playing to the strengths of, of what um, human interpreters are really good at. Okay, so step one um, with this particular data set, what we wanna do is divide Australia up into little 10 by 10 centimeter tiles. Um, we're looking at 10, centimetre, 10 square kilometre tiles because the things that we're looking at, like all, all deposits, uh, will be on that fairly large hundreds of metres to kilometres scale. Um, what we end up with is we tile the whole country uh, by 10 by 10. We end up with 68,000 images. Um, and you can see some examples of those image tiles um, here. So basically every little image tile has an image in it with a colour and a texture that is reflective of that magnetic and density kind of property that we're, we're mapping in the background. The next thing we want to do is we want to create some numbers that actually visually descri um, describe the image visually. So the way we can do that is we could just look at, you know, what is the R, G and B color value, but that wouldn't be a very descriptive way to understand our image. What we'd rather do is actually generate lots of different numbers that look at lots of, lots of the complex interactions between color and texture and produce a set of descriptive features that 
can describe that image the way that we would describe it as, as people looking at the image. So the way we do that is we use a neural network. Um, that neural network, um, in this case, wasn't even trained for something that was related to rocks. It was a very generic um, uh, model called ResNet 50, which is trained to look at lots of different um, classes of imagery um, that are outside of the discipline that we're interested in. And what we're going to do is feed our little tiles into this network and ask the network to, to generate us a series of numbers that describe the image. And we're not going to use the final classification of that network. So we don't care whether the network thinks that this rock image looks like an elephant or looks like a, a car. We're just going to use those, those numbers uh, in the network itself to, to describe the image. Okay, so um, apologies for the uh, very flashy image uh, here, but what we're looking at here is all of those tiles. Um, we're looking through 2,048 image features that we created um, uh, through the Australian continent. And you can see that uh, you know, we, there's lots of different um, numbers attached to each of those squares. In isolation, those numbers don't mean a lot, but if we look at them all together, they're going to hopefully help us to discriminate and group imageries um, based on those, um, on those numbers. And they're going to hopefully contain information about the colors, the textures, the geometries, and a bit of spatial context as well. So what we're looking at here, again, lots of, lots of moving data points here, but what we have is the Australian continent divided into those cubes, attributed with a, a colorful cluster number. Um, and what they're doing is they're shifting between their similarity um, space in n-dimensional space. So in, um, in this case, it was, uh, I believe it was a UMAP or TSNE or something like this. Um, and then they're moving from ge geographic space to similarity space. So if we just focus on one of these clusters, there's a green cluster that skirts the whole perimeter of Australia. That green cluster moves from being on the coastal regions to being a nice compact cluster down the bottom right of the image. Um, so that group um, or that population of tiles is associated with where we get a change from continental crust to, to kind of more oceanic crust around the edges of the continent which has a very discrete or very um, distinctive geophysical signature. And that means that when those, um, those images are, are, um, uh, are grouped, they all kind of come up in the same cluster. So that can tell us that this process is actually doing something, um, something sensible. Okay, so what we end up with, if we actually analyze each of those clusters in general, is we end up with thousands and thousands of, of tiles that have been grouped together to form one of these, these clusters or groups of images that look similar. Um, and then it's up to us as geologists to go through and try to figure out what we think these clusters are actually um, denoting. So they could be, you know, um, things to do with uh, uh, very old Archean rocks in the, in, the, in the Yulgan. They could be rocks that are covered by a lot of, um, a lot of sediments. They could be that kind of oceanic continental boundary or et cetera, et cetera. So this model has just done something quite, quite simple in the sense that it said, put all the images together that look the same, but it doesn't have any model to guide it in terms of how it's doing that other than us just deciding how many groups we think would be relevant. Um, so that's where our domain can kind of start to give, give meaning to these clusters. Okay, so what does it look like when we do this over the whole continent? So on the left, we have our original image, which is our original kind of geophysical image of Australia. And then on the right, we've got this kind of dom visually domained uh, version of the continent here. So colors that look the same on that right-hand side image are, are from image tiles that look visually similar um, and visually similar in a way that would, would um, be very similar to how we would see them as a, as a human interpreter. And so the question might be, well, why, why would this be something interesting to do? Um, so the one question could be, uh, if I'm looking for a certain type of ore deposit, um, and I know that that ore deposit exists inside that green unit, then if I'm looking for another one, I'll also want to look inside that green unit. So that, that's, that's one way that something like this could potentially help you find an ore deposit. Um, and in, in the next slide, I'll show you a more defined example at a much smaller scale about when we've quantified the visual appearance of these geophysics, we can actually phrase really interesting questions to it that could help us find an ore deposit. So for instance, um, if I have an ore deposit in, a, in one of these tiles, go and find me all the tiles that look most similar to this. So that's a, a really applied example about how a workflow like this could actually help make a meaningful impact uh, in, in mining. Um, one thing that I thought was just kind of curious to note out, you see these kind of weird artifacts inside the, the data. Um, that's because in some of these regions, 
the data sets are much lower resolution than they are everywhere else. So what we're actually picking out is um, there's a cluster that's actually low resolution data. And I thought this was a really good call out because this is a, one of the big limitations of some of these models. Um, and one of the things that we're really good at as people is we can adapt. When the resolution drops, we understand that and we can change our thinking accordingly. When you have a computer vision model, the model just goes, this image doesn't look like anything else. Put them all together in their own cluster. So it's, it's smart in some ways, but also incredibly dumb in, in other ways, uh, which is, is always interesting. Okay, so let's move on to another quick um, uh, video here. So we talked about that idea that we might wanna go and search for a tile. So what we've done here is we've got this little kind of dashboard app and we've got some of this same kind of geophysics loaded into it. And we're going to ask a user to click on an anomaly and that anomaly is deemed to be of interest. So that anomaly might be associated with a copper deposit, for instance. And then we're gonna ask this, this workflow to return us all the tiles, no matter where they are in the country, that look the most similar to that and show us where those tiles actually are. So if we play the video again, we've selected this um, feature and then we've gone and returned a bunch, of different, um, a bunch of different tiles. We can also look at those tiles in different scales. So we could say, show me tiles that are 10 centimeters that look similar, five, five kilometers, sorry, 10 kilometers, two kilometers. And then we can actually go and look at all of those things together. So here we're looking at um, the large, scale similarity in blue. So 10, say 10 by 10 square kilometer tiles. Then we've got the tiles that look similar in the kind of middle scale range. And then we've got tiles that look similar at a much finer scale range. And we can actually plot them in geographic space. Here's our selected point in white. And then everywhere where we've got red, green and blue colors is where we've got a region that looks similar. And so an argument could be made that if I'm trying to explore for the thing under the white point, I should go and look for areas that have similar signatures at these different scales. Um, and so this is, I guess, an applied example of how that kind of computer vision workflow can help us explore for an ore deposit in a way that's quite different to the way we do it currently, which is a lot of people making, making decisions and, and sometimes subjective decisions. Can we actually do that with, um, with, a, with a computer vision model and machine learning? Okay, moving on to um, the next, case study. So <clears throat> previously we talked about that pit wall. We have this kind of stepped set of walls that, that kind of define the sides of our pit. Um, and in any given pit, we might have many kilometers of wall that we need to actually analyze regularly to make sure that they're safe. They're not going, they're not changing and collapsing. Um, and, uh, and basically everything's kind of in, in order. Um, so what we'll do in this, um, in this case study is try to understand the condition of those walls using a comp another computer vision model um, and have that model trained by the expert, but allow it to be applied over large amounts of data really quickly. So, so setting the scene here, um, geotechnical engineers, which are the type of engineers that, that look after the stability of, of things like open pits and underground mines, um, they spend a lot of time looking at the walls. The walls are the things that keep everything up and, and keep everybody safe. So movement in those walls, the, the shape of them, the, um, the overall kind of appearance of them are all important factors in making sure that wall is, is, is doing what it should be doing. What we've got here is a series of, of walls. We've got four different kind of stepped walls. This is from a, a very large mine in West Africa that had something like 70 kilometers of wall that, that the engineers had to actually analyze um, on the regular basis. Um, they had a drone fly around and collect a lot of imagery of the walls, but that didn't really help them because then they just had to sit there and look through 70 kilometers of, of wall imagery, which is, is, it's great they've got the data, but it doesn't actually solve their problem and, and, and free up time. So what we did is we trained a computer vision model to look for four specific types of, of wall. Uh, we have what we call a regular wall. So that's basically where we have lots of different overhangs and, and lots of irregular shapes. Um, we have debris, which is material that's kind of fallen off the wall onto the bench below. Uh, we've got nice flat, clean walls, which is what they're, what they're going for. They prefer these walls to all be perfectly flat and smooth. That's a nice safe wall. Um, and then we've got this thing called pre-split drill holes. If you can see the image here, there's these little kind of vertical stripes. That's basically where we drilled a hole and extracted that cylinder of rock that we talked about before. Um, we put a bunch of explosives down it and then we blasted that rock off the wall. 
Um, and so I won't go into lots of detail about it, but suffice to say that we want to see those little those little vertical lines in the wall. That means that's a, a good a good looking wall that, that broke correctly. Okay, so how do we actually build the model? Well, we engaged a bunch of geotechnical engineers. We supplied them with lots and lots of examples of these wall imagery. And we said, draw polygons around each of these different classes. And we give it to several different engineers. And we gave them hundreds of examples and asked multiple engineers to draw the same examples. And with the idea being that we were going to get a very consistent data set that was validated by multiple experts. Um, so here we've got our raw input image at the top. We've got the um, target mask or, the, or a validation label created by an engineer. And then on the bottom, we've got the results of one of our predictive models. And you can see that broadly, they look pretty close. They're not exactly the same, but um, they are, they are look, look like they're doing fairly good, a fairly good job. Um, and that's really what we want to get to. We want to be able to do this task, but on 70 kilometers worth of walls. And we want to be able to do it every week um, and do it you know, within a couple of hours of processing. So here's our, our raw predictions. Um, we have to divide the walls up into squares so we could put them into the into this network um, correctly and need a, a roughly square image. Um, so we do get some sort of kind of vertical artifacts. And what we're looking at is the confidence scores um, on a pixel wise segmentation um, for these four different classes. So we can see that where we have bright yellow colors, that's where the model was pretty confident that it found that class at that location. When we have the dark blue colors, the model was, was not confident. So here's an example of the prediction back on the walls. Um, and we can see here that um, you know, where we've got the purple color, for instance, we see a lot of really irregular shapes. We see big promontories of wall hanging out. We've got overhangs. We've got big concave kind of cutouts. Uh, where we've got the yellow class, we see these nice vertical um, stripes. These are our pre-split drill holes. Um, and uh, where we have um, kind of the lighter purple color, we have a lot of debris. So it's material that's basically just fallen off the wall onto the ground, which is a a sign of instability. So what we've done here is kind of taken that visual kind of work that the engineer is doing and we've made a model to kind of replicate it. But that didn't actually get us to the end result. We actually had to give this wall a score, a score between zero and 10 um, to keep it in line with what the engineers were required to do on a daily basis. So zero represents a wall that is terrible. It's going to fall down. It's got all the hallmarks of the worst wall you've ever seen. 10 is a beautiful flat, awesome wall that, that's doing everything it should be doing. Um, and what we did is we divided the wall into these kind of five metre sections and we just simply analysed what classes were found in that kind of vertical slice of five metres. And then we used this kind of weighted linear equation to, to come up with a score between zero and 10. So you can see here that where we have scores approaching 10, so the green zone in the centre here, we've got flat bits of wall, we've got pre-split drill holes, therefore these scores are coming in closer to 10. That means that they're in better shape. The worst part of this wall is this area here, which is getting a score that's sort of around three. And you can see that the wall itself is terrible. It's got all these you know, weird uh, geometries in it. So that's essentially um, an example of how the computer, computer vision model trained by experts can see the rock in a similar way to the experts, but at a much larger scale, uh, much larger speed, um, and, and really free them up to be able to, to do other things rather than this monotonous grind of looking at 76 kilometers of walls every week. Okay, uh, so moving on to uh, another case study here. This will be our last one. Um, and here we're looking at uh, core photos. So we talked a bit about core photos in, in, on one of the early slides. Um, and we're going to use computer vision to clean up a really dirty historic data set. And then we're going to use that same computer vision kind of modeling approach to extract some valuable geological information from that, um, from that drill core. So here is a pretty typical uh, set of core photos. Um, these core photos come in all shapes and sizes. Um, they're, they're these you know, cylinders of rock we've drilled out of the ground, but beyond that, everyone does it a little bit differently. So in some places we use wooden bo uh, boxes, sometimes we use plastic, cardboard, metal. Uh, boxes can be two rows and two meters long. They can be sometimes very short and have many rows um, and what often happens is that these imagery don't really get used because they're so kind of uh, unkept and unstructured. So one of the really real beauties of computer vision is we can, we can get it to deal with a lot of variation as long as we train it to, to understand that variation. And potentially we could go and clean up a very large amount of data quite quickly. So to give you a feel for scale, um, you know, a, a long running mine that could have been running for something like 30 years, 
might have several million meters of, of drill core imagery um, like this. So it's such a large amount of data that if you just ask someone to go and clean this up manually by hand, they would be there for an eternity. So you really have to try to kind of automate this cleanup um, as best you can. So the first thing that we want to do is um, we want to get rid of the stuff out of the image that we don't actually care about. So in a core box, what we really care about is the rock, which means that the stuff that's kind of outside of that, we really just kind of want to get rid of it and blow it away. So the first thing we might want to do is crop out the box from the image. Uh, then we might want to crop the rows of rock. So these red cropping marks here are a computer vision model that's been trained on thousands of images to know what a row of rock looks like. Um, once we've got those rows, then we can start looking at the rock itself inside the rows. We can segment different kinds of rock. So rock that's cylindrical in shape, rock that's broken. We can look for these little wooden core blocks that they put in to track how deep they are. Um, and uh, essentially finally get to a version of that imagery that's really neat. Uh, it's got rid of all the stuff we don't care about. Um, and we can actually use this to do some further analysis. Um, and the cool thing about using something like computer vision is that um, we could process, you know, tens of thousands of images in a matter of minutes, provided that model has been trained appropriately. Okay, so the next thing that's really important with drill core imagery is because it's a cylinder that's collected kind of deep into the ground, every pixel of that image has to be registered in depth. So um, the way we do that typically is that we draw these little marks on the rock. Uh, you can see some here, they've got these little white marks and they've got someone in chalk that's written 212, 213, 214, 215. That means that that piece of rock was 212 meters in the ground when it was collected and, and so on and so forth. So what we need to do is potentially use a, a different kind of uh, machine learning called optical character recognition to try and automatically read that handwriting and attribute that image with a depth. Uh, and, and so again, if we were to try and do this all manually, on millions of meters of core photography, then we might be there for an eternity, just clicking and going, it's that deep, it's that deep, it's that deep. So what we can do here, we've got some um, examples from our OCR detections. We are reading the numbers and we're digitally ascribing that, that pixel with a depth. So now we've given that, that cleaned up image some more metadata that describes its depth in the ground, which is a really important step to be able to use it for, for interesting geology. Once we've given that image the depth, then we can actually start to look at other things that are inside the core. So in this case, we're, we're um, classifying different kinds of breaks. Um, it's really important that we know how the rock breaks because that will um, speak to its stability. If we're digging a tunnel through it, if we're maybe putting walls into it, um, we wanna know whether that rock's likely to fall apart and break or whether it's very strong. Um, so we can, again, use a computer vision model to detect those things um, somewhat automatically. Um, and this will be something that would traditionally be done by a geotechnical engineer. It can be very arduous and means that they can't really look at that much rock very quickly. They have to, you know, painstakingly move through the rock, um, you know, uh, one meter at a time. Okay, so the previous kind of use case was more about cleaning data up. Now we'll talk about an interesting use case where we can extract something that's really geologically interesting from that imagery. So in this case, we're going to look at something that, that are called veins. Veins are these kind of semi-planar features that cut through a body of rock. Um, they're usually made of a different kind of mineral than the rock around it. And veins are really important because they can carry a lot of these kind of metals that, that we like to mine. So veins like the ones you see here, which looks like a kind of a quartz vein. Those quartz veins might be full of gold or copper or, or uh, you know, that could be anything. Um, so finding and understanding and mapping veins is really important for, for when we're trying to mine, um, mine an ore deposit. So talking a little bit about um, different kinds of deep learning based image analysis. So there's kind of four main ways that we can kind of analyze uh, an image of rock. Um, and from left to right, they kind of go from the most simplistic to most complex in terms of the model architecture. Um, if we're looking at a rock with a vein through it, so in this case, the vein is this kind of white thing that's chopping through this sort of gray rock. Um, we could just classify that image. And that would be just saying, does this image contain a vein or does it not contain a vein? That's, that's a simple classification problem. Um, if we move up the complexity, we can move to something like semantic segmentation. Um, this is where we're saying, find me all the pixels inside this uh, image uh, that belong to the class vein. Um, so here we've got these kind of blue polygons that appear on top of the veins themselves. And this could be useful for us looking at the areas and volumes of, of veins. Uh, if we keep moving up com the complexity, uh, then we move on to things like object detection. 
Here, we might be trying to predict a bounding box around um, a, a vein feature, um, and, but we're not worrying about its exact boundaries. And then instance segmentation, we're actually mapping the exact boundaries of lots of different examples of veins. So object detection and instance segmentation are, are much more complicated than semantic segmentation and classification because they have to understand the concept of what is one instance of a vein and what happens when one vein is on top of another vein. So they have to understand you know, what one of those things are and then how those individual things can interact with each other, which in geology can be a very complex interaction. So next we're gonna talk about and show an example of semantic segmentation to extract vein information. Okay, so um, this is from a deposit in here in Victoria called um, Sunday Creek. It's a orogenic gold deposit, basically means it's, it's got gold in quartz veins. Uh, it's also got um, uh, stibnite antinomy, antinomy uh, which is a, another useful element. Um, and the th what we had to do here was find um, five different classes of veins for this particular um, uh, ore body. The veins are one of the most important things to log here because they contain a lot of the elements that they're looking for but they're also the most arduous thing to, to log as a geologist. So this is an example of, of four meters of core that have been annotated for the purposes of building a machine learning model. Um, if you had to do this manually everywhere, it would take you know, years and years of your life to go and draw around every single one of these veins and actually be able to measure it and class it. So the idea is we can just you know, do this on a small amount of data and then build a model that can do it on, on a very large amount of data. So we, we labeled 5,865 individual polygons. Um, and then we built a model to, to apply to around 13 kilometers of drill core. And the key thing we wanted to do was find what class of vein did we have? Where did we have it? And what was its volume? That were the three things that we needed to determine. And this would be directly replacing something that a person would have to do by visual estimation um, on, on the core. So here's an example of the model itself. On the top, we have that kind of cropped curated row of, of core photography. And then on the row below, we have um, these kind of colorful blobs um, that, that have basically been predicted over each class of vein. Um, and then underneath that, we've got some different um, uh, statistics that we've calculated. So we've got half a um, 0.56 centimeter squared of pyrite, um, which is a type of, uh, of mineral. We've got uh, no stibnite. We've got 15.1 cubic centimeters of quartz. We've got 51 cubic centimeters of quartz and stibnite. And so we can see we've got a very quantitative volume estimate of each of these vein classes. If a person was logging this core, they would say that this meter is dominantly composed of this type of vein. And I think there are five veins per meter. That's about as much detail as a, as a human logger could devote to this task. But using computer vision, we can go a whole another level down in terms of complexity and quantification um, to improve it. So we did this every, every meter. This is about one meter. We did this to about 13,000 meters um, of core. And so what that looks like uh, in kind of in total, uh, what we're looking at here is a three-dimensional kind of representation under the ground. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got these little kind of gray lines. These are the, what we call drill strings. They're the trace of the drill hole that it took under, under the ground. So you get these kind of lots of lines coming at different angles as they're drilling into the ground for, you know, to, to define this particular bit of rock. And what you can see here is these little colored kind of disks on the drill strings. This is what the people managed to log um, in their core shed by hand. So it's only a really small amount of, of information. And all they were really able to do was say, what was the dominant type of vein that they found? Um, on the right is the volume data that was generated from the computer vision approach, which basically is saying, here is a certain type of vein, here is the, the area or the, the vol um, area percent of this particular type of quartz vein. And I've covered all the data that they had. So all the drill holes have a, a value um, for the volume of this particular quartz vein and the stibnite vein and the pyrite vein and all of those other things that we've detected. And so you can see this, the amount of data we've got is far higher. We're looking at a very fine scale of resolution and we're taking something that takes people just absolutely forever to do. And we're doing it in a relatively short space of time. And so I think this is probably one of the best examples of if we can you know, augment the processes that we're using in mining and speed them up and get better data, that's what's going to really help us um, mine more efficiently, find ore deposits more efficiently, 
and, and ultimately, ultimately try and meet the demand that, that's increasing all the time for, for the decades to come. So, um, so yeah, that's probably my last slide. And um, yeah, I guess I'll throw it out to, um, to any questions.